My name is Dwight, DJ D-Dub. Uh, man, I am the DJ for the Broco team. Um, I play music, so if you see me in a commercial just spinning, I'm spinning records and stuff like that, playing your favorite songs. Um, this time, I just uh, decided that I want to come from around the booth and talk to the guests as well. I I was a little jealous that they was asking these questions and I didn't get any questions in. So I just wanted to ask, because uh, right now I'm on this thing of music gets me through, right? And I'm talking to different um, artists, I'm talking to different entrepreneurs, like such as yourself, Mr. Isaac, like just doing things in the community. Um, I know that in a community you're doing great things and they're gonna know exactly who you are and what you do. But as um, far as music, man, um, I just wanted to ask you, like, what are you listening to when you scale in the businesses and you're doing these events and you talking to, you know, people? Of course, you got to be in your car. Yeah. Of course, you got to get ready. Of course, you got to get in the shower. You know, I think everybody gets an Emmy Award when they sing it in the shower. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know what I'm saying? Um, so what, what, are you, what are you listening to and, and what's, what music is getting you through in this moment? So for me, uh, if I'm like on the way to a meeting or kind of getting motivated, I'm listening to Nas. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. So like right now, oh, um, Nas. Nas? I'm yeah, listening to uh, Nas. 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 Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like, you know, I'm listening to KD3 on repeat okay. right now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, King Disease, King Disease. Trilogy, trilogy is, was dope. Yeah. Uh, is dope. Um, in the morning, I start off with some meditative music as well. So, you know, like you know, like the right hurts, right frequency yeah. type yeah. meditation music. Yeah. Um, you know, if I'm kind of pulling up something kind of late night smooth, mm -hmm. late night meeting, or like meeting up with some associates for like maybe drinks and talking business, yeah. I may pull up to, you know, pull up with some, with some, uh, with some jazz playing. Okay. You know what I'm saying? And so, people don't realize that that is some form, because you, you're doing jazz, but also meditation is music too. Like people don't realize that meditation. I was talking about that literally two years ago. Um, I was just letting people know, hey, make sure you go outside of your average genres and what people are telling you to listen to. Like, start listening to meditation. Meditation is, is music. Instrumentals is music. Yep. Going outside, hearing the trees, that's music. Nature, all of that is music. So for you to say that, I think that's awesome that you do that. Um, even just listening to jazz music before you go to an event. So like, if you're listening to rap or you listen to something that might plug into your mind when you go into a business, or it might throw you off, you know, because you're listening to something that's totally opposite than what you're trying to attract or what you're trying to achieve. So my favorite uh, song from King of Thieves is my bike. The smoothest DJ, DJ D Dub, Groove Nation. Turn it up, turn it up, turn it up, turn it up. Boy, I told you I'm a beast. Feel like David and the lion in the streets. Stay humble as I can be. What's up, good people? It's your boy, bro, Troy. Bro, Smith. Bro, Kirk. And we are the Bro Code. The Bro Code's back at it again, man. The Bro Code show is all about having courageous conversations with individuals in the community, loving relationships, business, entrepreneurship, and the culture, and most and foremost, wellness is the new cool. Today we're having another one of those courageous conversations with a community leader that most already know, but we're gonna introduce him here on the Bro Code Show. He goes by, hold on, let me get it right now. You got a many names, let me get it right. Isaac Brennan Horton the Fourth. Yeah. Is that right? That's right. How you feeling today, brother? I feel excellent, man. Good, I'm glad good, you guys man. took the time to come out here. Yeah, man. Well, thank you for, for, for bringing us out here, man. If y'all can't see, we are in Raleigh, North Carolina. We got the backdrop. Sun's going down, man. Things are good. Tell the people where we're at. Yeah, we're in downtown Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, we're at my office at the WeWork building, um, right at the top of Glenwood South, right in downtown. I love it. I love it. Now, for those who are watching, Isaac, they may already know, but there's some that may not know who you are, man. So we always tell our guests, you have 90 seconds or less to run your resume. Put some respect on your name. So I'm Isaac Brennan Horton IV. I'm an eighth generation Raleighite. My family goes back to the plantation here. So I am uh, consider myself a son of Raleigh. Uh, I have a vested interest in 
this community. Uh, I started off as a little kid knocking on your door asking if I could mow your lawn for five bucks in 1994. And entrepreneurship was something that I knew I always wanted to do. So uh, being where I am today is very organic. I have a passion for food. I have a passion for people. And I have a passion for uh, success. And so uh, I've started a few companies over the, over the past 10 years. Uh, I've, I've owned car dealerships. I've owned private transportation companies. I've owned pest control companies, uh, I own food establishments, and I've launched some new businesses that I'm sure we'll get into uh, in a bit. Uh, and I've also had several community positions. Uh, I've been on the board of directors for downtown for several years, and I uh, love giving back. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. That's one of the ways that I connected with you as well. Thank you for that. So we're going to get into it. We're going to do it a little different. Uh, we're going to ask rapid fire questions. Now, Isaac, don't get scared. It's OK. I promise you we're going to keep it very respectful, bro. <laughs> But these, the questions, uh, the answers to these questions are just yes or no. Okay. You ready? I'm ready. All right, real quick, man. Do you have pets? No. Do you have kids? No. Are you married? No. Do you own your own home? Yes. Do you have siblings? Yes. Have you ever lived abroad? No. Have you ever traveled abroad? Yes. Are you active on social media? Yes. Do you enjoy running? Yes. Would you ever try stand-up comedy? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Would you ever appear on a reality show? Yes. Do you think that you could win a game show? Yes. Have you ever moved across country? No. Do you speak more than one language? No. Do you consider yourself tech savvy? Yes. Do you enjoy performing in front of an audience? Sometimes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't be shy, don't be shy now. Have you ever won a contest? Yes. Do you believe in, in finding a soulmate? Yes. Do you, sleep, do you sleep with stuffed animals? No. Have you ever won a bet? Yes. All right, we're going to let you off the hook with that. Okay. We're going to let you off the hook. We got 20 questions with Isaac Brennan Horton the fourth. So let's jump into this conversation. Before we do that and really talk about the beginning stages of life, is there any secret passions? Like we talk about business, when you talk about entrepreneurship, you are in that all day long. But there's, is there something that the people may don't know about you? Yeah, I have a passion for public speaking mm. and inspiration. Mm. Uh, particularly in the economic space, mm -hmm. economic empowerment mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a passion for, for food equity mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. The apex of those two things yeah. is where my passion aligns. Access. Yeah, for the yeah. past, you know, uh, majority of a decade, people kind of know me from a position of food service. Yeah. But I have, I have had a secret passion that is now coming of age. Yeah. That, you know, coming out. And I think we're going to talk a little bit more yeah, about that, right? It's starting yeah. to bud a little bit yeah. more. I see yeah. that glow on your face yeah. when you yeah. talk yeah. about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Well, let's chop it up, man. Let's start from the beginning stages. Man. Yeah, let's take it back. We're going to get into those passions, but okay. I, I'm curious where it all started. You know, I know your father has done a number of things. You know, he's been a serial entrepreneur, much like you. How much do you attribute your success and your passion for entrepreneurship to the work that your father and, and perhaps your family and the generations that you spoke of? Mm. How did that build that passion inside of you? Yeah, I, you know, so for me, I'd say that family, family legacy has been something, a principle that was instilled into me at, the, at a very young age. Yeah. Um, particularly as an African-American in the South, mm. you know, um, pride is something mm. that is important for us to put into the hearts of young kids. Mm. Because oftentimes where there may be a lack of uh, resources in our community, mm -hmm. the intangible elements of the spirit motivate us generation after generation to be able to establish things for our future generations yeah. mm -hmm. that will level the playing field and empower us to live the type of life that we would like for our children to live, mm -hmm. you know, definitely not only an, an equal uh, life, but an empowered life. Mm -hmm. um, and so mm -hmm. it starts back for me with my great grandfather, my great grandfather on, on both sides. Mm -hmm. my, my great grandfather, uh, my great great grandfather was a bootlegger mm -hmm. in uh, North, North Raleigh. Okay. When uh, the slaves were freed, you know, people got 40 acres and a mule. Mm. Some of us. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Let's, 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 yeah. Let's, 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 let's. <laughs> and a lot more people got it than, than we realized, but it, it wasn't a, a genuine, uh, you know, a genuine gift mm -hmm. in the sense that the estate 
tax laws were used mm -hmm. to repossess a lot of land. Mm -hmm. So if you were under 18, you, you didn't have to pay the taxes on the land. Mm -hmm. But they manipulated the estate tax to be able to repossess a lot of the freed slaves land. And so my family owned about 5% of Raleigh. Oh, wow. We owned mm -hmm. from 540 Six Forks exit mm -hmm. to Capitol Boulevard. Mm -hmm. So Capitol Boulevard, Wake Forest Road, mm -hmm. Six Forks, mm -hmm. 540, all the way back to the city limit. Mm -hmm. So pretty much, you know, yeah. maybe a fourth of it's mid or eighth of North North Raleigh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, and some of our, my family still owns that land, mm -hmm. but my line, uh, my ancestor was actually above 18, so that land was taken away. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, uh, when my family moved downtown to Chavis Heights, which was a freed slave community, mm -hmm. we, it was because we were ousted out of North Raleigh. Mm -hmm. And that's on my dad's side. On my mom's side, my great-grandfather was one of the state's first engineers. Mm -hmm. He went to A&T when it was Agricultural and Mechanical mm -hmm. College, mm -hmm. North Carolina A&M. And he received a degree in mechanical engineering. Uh, and he built a lot of the African-Americans homes in eastern North Carolina. Wow. And he was the first African-American in North Carolina to own a, a, a car registered wow. with the North Carolina Department wow. of Transportation. So my great grandfather owned the first, was the first black person to have a car wow. in, North, in North Carolina. And the first African-American to own a bus. And he, because he was an engineer and built a lot of the homes in Eastern North Carolina, he had money. Yeah. And he was able to buy a bus to provide transportation because back then, you know, mm. black folks couldn't even afford horse and buggy. Yeah. Huh. Right. Mm. Um, and so my great grandfather on my dad's side uh, was a Baptist preacher. Mm -hmm. And my grandfather was a Baptist preacher. And he he uh, was the pastor for a time at first Baptist Church right on Wilmington Street downtown. Ah, yeah. My dad was born on Shaw's <laughs> campus when they wouldn't accept African-American children in the hospital. Shaw had the first mm -hmm. four-year medical school in the United States. Um, and they had a nursing program. Mm -hmm. And so if, you know, you were close by and you were, you know, in labor, mm -hmm. you could go to Shaw and someone could help you. Mm -hmm. So my dad was born on Shaw's campus. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I have a legacy of, of strong, intelligent, bold, mm -hmm. courageous mm -hmm. African American uh, people in my family mm -hmm. that really instilled in me certain principles that have empowered me to be on this journey that I'm on now. Yeah. yeah. Well, I thought King James sons had it tough in terms yeah. of just <laughs> living underneath that that legacy. I can only imagine uh, the pressure that you had growing up to to do the things that you've done. You know, you made mention of a number of different businesses that you've started. Um, what was your first and how do you go from, you know, owning vans to, to pests, to, to food, to the work that we'll get into? Like, they're so much so different in terms of their lanes. Like, where do you get the inspiration to even start these businesses? Well, like I said, you know, <coughs> my inspiration to be an entrepreneur and to start business started when I was very young. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, and what what I, you know, teach kids. Uh, is uh, oftentimes called uh, what I call cost consciousness. Mm. You know, oftentimes, um, you know, particularly in the black community, we kind of tell children, you know, stay in your lane. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. If you go to the grocery store with your mom, don't touch nothing. Don't, don't, don't ask right. for nothing. <laughs> you know, um, you go in your house and your mom comes in with something, you ask her how much it costs, and she says, don't worry about <laughs> no, it. Right. They got grown folks. Business. business. That's right. absolutely right. But, you know, um, my parents, uh, allowed me to be cost conscious. Mm -hmm. I got to ask questions about how stuff, how much things cost. Mm -hmm. um, and it helped me understand at a very young age value. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I understood that stuff wasn't free. Mm -hmm. I understood that it, it, it took effort to get things because I understood cost consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I got my first real lesson that I can remember, the youngest lesson I can remember, uh, every Friday I would get $5 for mm -hmm. allowance. Mm -hmm. For mowing the lawn, you know, taking out the trash, taking out the trash yeah. doing the dishes, <laughs> vacuuming, you know, helping out. And, uh, you know, which was great mm -hmm. because, 
you know, some of my friends didn't get nothing. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah. That's what you're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. Um, but every Friday I'd get five dollars, and I was a big X Men fan. Mm. Okay. Who was your favorite? I gotta ask. My favorite at that time was Wolverine. <laughs> that was that was mine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. And I was into action figures. I was a young kid. I think like I was like six. Mm. And I wanted this Wolverine action figure. I never forget. It was the action figure. He had the helmet. Yeah. And, and he was fresh out <laughs> of captivity. Mm. Mm. He was the freely, the, the newly freely liberated Wolverine. Get him. Right. He had the plugs in his arm. Mm-hmm. I, I had wanted one that. Too. Yeah. And <laughs> and it was twenty dollars. Mm-hmm. So I saved up five dollars times mm-hmm. four. Whole mm-hmm. month for a whole month. <laughs> yeah. We went to Kmart off of New Bern Avenue. Mm. Okay, when the Kmart was still when there. Still there. <laughs> yeah. And for Walmart knocked them out. <laughs> and I went back to the toy section. I'll never forget, I found that Wolverine. It was the last one there. Took it up to the front. We went to ring it out. And you didn't have enough. And it was twenty dollars <laughs> plus tax. <laughs> yeah. And that was my mom's way of teaching me tax. Mm-hmm. That's good. I didn't have enough. She mm-hmm. didn't give me the, the dollar oh, or yep. it was, yeah. right? Yeah. I had to wait another Friday. And I remember being frustrated on my way back home. And I thought to myself, man, this money thing is like mm. crazy. <laughs> like I need to do something to make more money. Mm. And I, re- I thought to myself, hmm, well, if I get $5 for doing stuff, maybe somebody else will give me $5 for doing stuff at their house. Mm-hmm. We had a lawnmower, so I went next door to mm. the elderly family that stayed mm-hmm. beside me, asked if I could mow their lawn. Mm. Now, I didn't try to parse out, I'm doing six tasks and I get $5. So maybe this is, I said, whatever I'm getting, that $5, I'm going to charge people, try to get that $5 from other people mm-hmm. by doing one task, right. mm-hmm. not a set of chores. Right. Mm-hmm. right. And from there, I, you know, I had like 40, 50 lawns, mm-hmm. you know, a year, year and a half later, and I was seven. And that was really the birth of my entrepreneurship. Mm-hmm. You, you know, wasn't think about that Wolverine no more. You could have had a whole X Men series. Yeah, that, I right? bought my, you know, I bought a Nintendo. I, I, you know, I started being, started thinking from position of economic empowerment, mm-hmm. not just trying to have, you know, enough to get the Buy one or two things that yeah. I want. Mm-hmm. But I started saving. Yeah, and you know, it was a, uh, it was something that kind of got my mentality. How can I always mm-hmm. take it to the next level? But then in middle school, I started cleaning medical offices. Mm-hmm. Um, my uncle, uh, my mom's older brother's uh, doctor, and I would start off by cleaning his office. Mm-hmm. You know, he gave me a job, mm-hmm. so I'd wipe stuff up, take the trash out, and you know, I would get like a hundred dollars. And I was thinking to myself, man, this took me two hours. Mm-hmm. And I got a hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. I'm like nine. Uh-huh. And I'm over long. I get five dollars. That takes me. <laughs> and I'm hot. And I'm hot. I, I gotta yeah. clean up. Right? Like, man, so I need to like <laughs> drop these lawns. Mm-hmm. I need to start doing more medical offices. Mm-hmm. You know, and then in high school, um, I started throwing parties. Mm. There was nothing, no place for really for black kids to really go and have a good time. Mm-hmm. You know, so uh, I put on a suit. And you know, New Bern Avenue was my was my area. NBA, you know. <laughs> so I went down to the Ezra Event Center, mm-hmm. and I put a suit on, and I talked to the people there. They thought I was over eighteen. I was like, you know, sixteen years old. Presentation. I that was right. This is nineteen. You know, this is like nineteen ninety nine, two thousand. Mm-hmm. You know, um, the personal computer. Mm-hmm. was something that people were starting to get now. Yep. Mm-hmm. The internet was out, mm-hmm. right? I used to go have to go to R.B. Harrison to look stuff up. Yeah. Now I had a personal computer, I had a gateway. Mm-hmm. And I could go in there and I, one of the first things I, I taught myself was contracts. Mm-hmm. So I looked at contracts, legal contracts mm-hmm. on the internet, and I started writing my own contract. Mm-hmm. So I wrote a contract for the Esri Event Center for me to be able to throw my events there once a month. And so I would invite you know, students from Enlo, mm-hmm. where I went to school, from Southeast, mm-hmm. from Millbrook, you know, and cool. I would throw it a uh, an event once a month at the Ezra Event Center, and I would charge ten dollars, mm-hmm. and I have maybe like three hundred people come, so mm-hmm. I was making like three, three to four grand mm-hmm. a month mm-hmm. throwing events, which led up to my biggest event right before I went to undergraduate school. I threw it at the North Carolina State Fairgrounds, okay, and I had twenty one hundred students come and advertise to. Uh, to about 30 high schools uh, in the area. I'd get out of school at 215 in Enlow. I had a car, I'd drive over to Millbrook. I'd drive over to Leesville. And um, at this point in time, that same uncle who let me clean his medical offices, 
was the physician for Walnut Creek, okay, which is now Coastal Federal Amphitheater. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I'd go backstage on some of those concerts, mm -hmm. you know, and I saw that uh, if you were like really connected, mm -hmm. you had a VIP yeah. pass. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I thought that was always cool because people walked around Walnut Creek, they knew that, okay, he could go in the back, he mm -hmm. must be an important person. Uh -huh. So I took that type of prestige marketing and I converted it over to my concept. So what I did was, I looked up on, on the internet, all the high schools in Wake County, all the high schools in Durham County, all the high schools in Orange County. And what I did was I put my face on a, on a, on on a lanyard, on yeah. a lanyard. Yeah. I put the, my pass, my graduation pass. Mm -hmm. Cause Project Grad was kind of like something they had then, but it wasn't, it wasn't really like popping how people wanted it because it was overly chaperone. You know, mm -hmm. people kind of wanted to let their hair down, but you know, it's a hundred parents at those right. parties. And so I picked, you know, the top, four most popular people at every high school. Mm -hmm. It was normally like the SGA president mm -hmm. and like the captain of the basketball Drum team, major. Or the star football, yeah, right. the pretty cheerleader mm -hmm. everyone liked, mm -hmm. or whoever it was. And I gave them these passes first. Mm -hmm. And I told them, you know, wear it once or twice a week. They loved it, they were wearing it every mm -hmm. day. And people would ask, hey, where'd you get that, you know, you get that from? You know, and I gave them, I had VIP. Mm -hmm. I had VIP parking mm -hmm. at the fairgrounds. And I partnered with uh, another uh, two uh, excellent brothers who are still entrepreneurs to this day. Uh, last name Short, Marcus. Yeah, and he runs the barbershop, yeah, billionaire. Yeah, 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 I love the Short family. family. Yeah, yeah. Wanda, and, I, yeah, oh. and see, Marcus was uh, was four years older than me. So when I was g coming into high school, he was going Easy. out. Yeah, and he would throw parties at Cheryl. So I filled the void when Marcus went out. But for this party, it cost me about about five grand mm -hmm. to do this party. And I was 17. Mm. And so I had I had about 4,000 I had, you know, that I would be willing to risk. Yeah. Because the other money I was saving up for college. And uh, so I wanted to, you know, get the other two grand in. And I, you know, partnered with those guys. Isaac, let's do a favor. We got to pay bills. Okay. I want you to put a pin in that. Remember where you okay. ended? We're okay. going to come back. All right. But like you said, we have cost analysis. <laughs> we got to pay some of that. Right here on the Bro Code Show, we got Isaac Brennan Horton the fourth. We'll be right back. Yeah, that's good. My name is Dwight Hines, a.k.a. DJ D-Dub. Uh, the business, the company is Javier Bentonforth Montez. As a DJ, I don't go from just playing one song to the next. I actually get to give you an experience on how important music is. And that's for all ages. So speaking of all ages, we came to uh, Southeast Raleigh Elementary School, came and rocked out. Uh, I have my, my brother Troy. Let me explain who you really are. See, while watching Animal Planet, I noticed that wolves, they travel fast. Fish travel in school. Camels travel in caravans. Birds travel in flocks. Elephants travel in herds. Bees travel in swarms. But what I really found interesting that lions, they travel in pride. See, I had to think about that a little bit more. You see, lions live a lifestyle of pride. It's not just what they are and what they do, but it's in them. And about how lions are courageous, they are determined. Hi, I'm Clive Edwards, the proud assistant principal here at Southeast Raleigh Elementary School. I've known um, Troy Johnson for the last three years. We opened our doors in 2019. Troy and his organization have been a tower of strength for us, supporting us along the way with students' social and emotional behaviors. You have also created a program that not only support kids in school, but also support kids out of school. 
For this program, we have supplement our behaviors where we've seen behaviors gone down uh, with students uh, that Troy work with. I'm proud to recommend anyone to this program because I'm a testament and our students are a testament of it today. Today, we're, at, we're doing our graduation and with Troy being the speaker, he not only can relate to the students that he worked with, but to all students because at some point, he touched every student in this building. I'm proud to have him as a partner, a friend, and someone I can always depend on. Thank you, Troy Johnson. Another one. We are right here at Southeast Raleigh Elementary. Thank you to Principal Fenner and Principal Edwards for bringing this experience to Southeast Raleigh Elementary. I'm Bro Troy and we're using words and inspiration and music to touch the hearts of our youth. This experience needs to be at every school in the nation, but let's start right here in North Carolina. So I'm challenging Wake County Public Schools right now to call Troy Jermaine Johnson, Married with Music Makes You Feel Good Entertainment. And let's bring this experience to you. So we're back on the bro code. And before the break, Isaac, you were talking to us about entrepreneurship. You were talking about cost analysis. You were talking about partnering with Marcus Short of Billionaires, where I just got my hair cut today. <laughs> so, <laughs> my beard, at least. Shout out to Marcus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, shout yeah. out to Billionaires. I've partnered with them before. So tell us a little bit about what you're talking about. Yeah, so, you know, at this point in time, you know, so I brought in some, you know, partners. Mm -hmm. It was the Shorts. It was mm -hmm. Juicy and Marcus. Mm -hmm. Because um, Juicy was my age. He okay. was over at Southeast. Okay. I was over at Enlo. Those were the two big titans mm -hmm. in Wake County at the mm -hmm. time, definitely from a social standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we rented out the, the uh, one of the buildings at the state fairgrounds. We had 2,100 people come to the party and we charged anywhere from 10 to $20. Mm -hmm. Regular admission was 10. VIP. VIP <laughs> was uh, 15. Mm -hmm. VIP with, with <laughs> VIP parking yeah. was 20. Mm -hmm. If it was if it was regular admission, the lanyard was blue, mm -hmm. it was like a fire and ice type of thing. Mm -hmm. It was blue. If you had VIP, it was red. It was red. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it was me and Juicy and Marcus on the flyer like this. You know, <laughs> yeah, the flat pose. Right? <laughs> flat pose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and yeah, we went to work. And uh, I mean, literally, um, we would, I'd get out of school at uh, 2.15. I hit a new high school every day. Mm. Um, then I started hitting Durham. Mm. Uh, like I said, I picked those those top, top uh, you know, most, you know, now we call them influencers mm. at, 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 the, uh, at each school. And people came out mm. and we had 2,100 people came and I think we made about $45,000 mm. um, right before I went to undergraduate school. Right on time. And yeah. like that cut, uh, you know, pay for my, uh, pay for my college. Mm. So yeah, it was, a uh, it was a unforgettable experience. Gotta love it, yeah. man. 45,000 might get you a semester these days. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> what you got, Kurt? Yeah, let's talk about college a little bit. Yeah. You're, you come from, your dad has a PhD in chemistry from Indiana, if I'm correct. So you come from an educational family too, right? Yeah. Now you're an entrepreneur. Did you know during your, like you went to UNCG, did you know at that time that you were gonna be an entrepreneur? Cause I know you had some regular jobs, but did you know that was gonna be something you're gonna be doing? Well, so I, um, I never had a job in high school. I always, you know, I was always an entrepreneur. So I was already an entrepreneur in my mind. Um, <clears throat> and college for me was something I really did for my parents. Mm. I really f feel that college slowed me down. Mm. I feel like it was a distraction. Mm. Um, you know, college is a relatively new invention. Mm. Um, you know, I think college is about like 200 years old, maybe. Mm. Um, maybe a little over, a little under. Uh, before college was the apprenticeship system, mm -hmm. where you would Trade. go and work yeah. directly under someone that had the skills mm -hmm. and expertise that you wanted. Yeah. You would, you know, observe, you would serve, mm -hmm. and then as a result, you would be able to learn those skills and you implement them mm -hmm. and you learn them in a real life environment, experiential yeah. knowledge, mm -hmm. not uh, theoretical. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, like, you know, having a great grandfather that went to college, it was, I was nowhere close to being a first generation college student. Right. It was more of a tradition mm -hmm. for me. You know, I just made forty five thousand dollars, yeah, and then had to go to college and, and spend go to class, right? <laughs> right. You know, yeah. I, I wanted to keep keep going, yeah, right. But so that was something I did for my parents. Mm. Let's talk about that, man. Yeah. Just if you don't mind, yeah. man, because so we work with kids. Like every day, Isaac, we are in a different elementary school, middle school, and sometimes even high school here in Wake County. 
doing social emotional learning, restorative practice, uh, small group activities, really impacting the kids from the inside out, giving them a sense of hope. You know, you just said, I, I once heard when we were talking at, with, um, at Central with uh, Dr. Heath, shout out to, to, to Rod. Yeah. He said, college isn't for everybody, but education is. So talk about that. What, what, what would you say to a youth that is struggling with that, is, is in that same space where their mom's 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 mom has a doctorate at this prestigious university, so therefore it's assumed that you're supposed to follow that same path, but that's not what's in your heart, you know? And here we are in 2023 where we have access. You know, this thing right here can give you access to multiple tools you know, what would you say to that kid? Like, how would you encourage their heart? Well, I mean, now everything is changing, right? You know, that's a very loaded question. It's multifaceted. <laughs> the answer is simple uh, inside of a, you know, inside of its own complexities. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if I would have gave you a very big answer, I would say it depends on what that person's vision for the for, for their life is. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that college is a a dying in, a dying invention. Mm. Yeah. Um, there was once said to be a man that had read every single book in the world, and now a new ten thousand books come out every three or four weeks. Mm -hmm. The rate of information that's being created is doubling and tripling every mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. There's so much information now as we come to the close of the information age that we're drowning in. It mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. creates a circumstance where people have to specialize. Yeah. Um, where specialties become even more specialized. Mm -hmm. A niche inside of a niche. Mm -hmm. What a, a student learns their freshman year in 2023 yeah, will be outdated yes. by 2027 mm -hmm. or 2028. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Education is something that should be generated f from within. Mm. Teaching kids the ability to learn mm -hmm. and to discern is mm -hmm. what I'm about. Mm -hmm. um, teaching kids deductive and inductive reasoning, problem solving. Mm. Mm. Um, these are the things that we need to start teaching kids as the substratum of education. Mm -hmm. um, you may never use a scientific equation in your life. Mm -hmm. um, you may never have to write, you know, a paper. Mm -hmm. Printed information has an expiration date. Mm -hmm. I love it. Um, you know, so the future in the next mm -hmm. 15 to 20 years can look very different. Mm -hmm. But what does not change is the skills for problem solving. Mm -hmm. Critical thinking. Yeah. Right. Critical thinking. Mm -hmm. Who knows where the next institution is going to be mm -hmm. in 20 years when college goes out. But if you're able to learn and teach, mm -hmm. analyze, um, and then the higher level is operating by discerning mm. instead of learning, mm. uh, operating by revelation so versus more, more, more information. Intuitive, more intuitive. Yeah, because See, what we're talking about with the rate of information tripling and doubling and more and more information coming out is what it does is it allows the inventive mm -hmm. ceiling to fall to a level of moderate attainment mm -hmm. where you used to have to be a genius to be able to create something new and now the slightly above average person can create, right? So okay. how do you now that things are accessible Mm -hmm. Now, for almost the vast majority of people to participate and create, how do you pick out the needle in mm -hmm. the haystack? Mm -hmm. Right? That comes from discerning, mm -hmm. not from learning. That comes from revelation, not from information. I love right? it. Picking love the it. needle in the haystack when there's a thousand options, there's mm -hmm. a thousand articles, mm -hmm. there's a thousand podcasts, mm -hmm. there's a thousand businesses, right? How do you find the blow code mm -hmm. in the haystack. Well, let's talk about that. Um, when we come back, we want to talk about that in mindset, right? Like uh, that mindset that you're talking about now evolved from a seven-year-old kid to what you are now over time. But if you didn't hold on to that, 
potentially you wouldn't be sitting here. So why mindset is important and then how you, how you secure that when we come back right here on the Bro Code Show. We'll be right back. My name is Troy Jermaine Johnson. I'm founder and visionary of YM4C, Young Men for Christ. And when I think of love and impact, <laughs> YM4C was born to do just that. Love on our youth consistently, creating lasting impact through opportunity and exposure to new things. This type of impact deserves to be spread to the masses. Your $6,000 donation will provide us the support needed to expand our message of hope to children in Zebulon and parts of Eastern Wake, as well as provide access to transportation, pro-social activities, and cultural competent life skill workshops to a population of children and families that don't normally get these opportunities. Serving the underserved with a spirit of excellence. The best is yet to come. We're back on the Bro Code Show with Isaac Brennan Horton IV. We've talked about a lot, bro. We've had some smiles, some laughs, but we want to talk about a subject matter that is really dear, near and dear to our heart, especially Bro Kirk. What you got, bro? So let's talk about mindset. You've been an entrepreneur. It'll be eight years in July. July of 2015, it'll be eight years this July. That's right. And they say that God doesn't put a spirit of fear in us. Mm. But we talk to a lot of people who would love to have their own business or do whatever they want to do but they're afraid. What is it about you when you can talk to them about their mindset that just like sets you apart and you continue to start new businesses? Tell us about the entrepreneurial mindset. Yeah, so I think the mindset of an entrepreneur to me centers in a few areas, but one of the biggest things that stands out for me is problem solving. Mm. Um, I think that um, the entrepreneur first is a visionary. Mm -hmm. That's one side of the coin. And then the other side of the coin is a problem solver. Mm -hmm. But the interesting, interesting thing about problem solving is that what I believe is that God makes people exceptional problem solvers who are problem seekers. Mm -hmm. um, the best problem solvers are people who seek out a problem, who have a passion, who see that in their vision, mm -hmm. and then they start to manifest the solutions. Yeah. And in the manifestation of a solution, you are stimulating value mm -hmm. and bringing value into the earth, and that value is exchange for money. Mm -hmm. So your service solves a problem, your product mm -hmm. solves a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, the mindset uh, for me um, in problem solving flows naturally into a thirst that I have for manifestation, mm -hmm. for glory. Mm -hmm. And we think about glory, you know, I'm not talking about like, woo, like praise, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I'm talking about glory from the true sense. Um, if you study the word glory and the meaning of glory, one would see that it has to do with the full expression of something. Yeah. Full expression of the nature and attributes of the thing mm -hmm. is what glory is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the full expression of a, a seed mm -hmm. is a tree. Mm -hmm. right? The glory of a, of a baby is an adult. Yeah. Um, and so what I say in terms of fear, fear is a form of paralysis, mm. right? If faith is the uh, evidence of things hope for the substance of things not seen mm -hmm. right um, then fear is the opposite mm -hmm. right it's the presence of things not hoped for mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the evidence of things seen mm -hmm. in other words the things that you don't want to happen mm -hmm. you having worry fear and anxiety about those things taking place and then as a result there is evidence of things that you did not want to the there would be the presence of. Right. And as a result, it stops people from wanting to move forward. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, um, my mindset, faith to me is not belief. Mm -hmm. Faith to me is a, is a spiritual force. Mm -hmm. I think it, that it's a, a spiritual technology. Mm -hmm. And I've used faith for my personal advantage and advancement as an entrepreneur. Faith is like a muscle. Mm -hmm. You work it with something small first. Mm -hmm. Starting a business may seem like a big, big thing. Yeah. It looks like a mountain at first. Mm -hmm. But just, you know, scale a hill. Mm -hmm. The next scale the next biggest hill. Scale the next biggest hill. Um, and that builds your faith and allows you to manifest more complex, yeah. uh, you know, more um, 
dynamic mm -hmm. uh, endeavors and desires. I love it. I love it. Yeah. So earlier you talked about something that's near and dear in our heart too, and that was partnerships. You talked about partnering with the Short Brothers. Yeah. How important is it to partner with people who are aligned in vision of what you're trying to build? Because I know you can't do all this alone. Yeah, right. absolutely. Absolutely. What I say to other entrepreneurs, and you know, I'm, I'm a relationship-based entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some people are mission-based, I'm relationship-based. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone knows that when you're mission-based, as soon as, you know, someone gets Short what they term. want from you, yeah. they're out. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, relationships are so important. It is impossible to achieve your destiny without the right relationship. That's right. Not you will just any relationships, right? Right, yeah. right. You would never, you would never be able to accomplish your destiny without the right relationships. Mm -hmm. There are blind spots that everybody has yep. that other people are there and destined to be there to help you see. Mm -hmm. What I tell entrepreneurs is if you are doing something all by yourself, it's just because it's not big enough yet. Yeah, you're doing it wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not big enough yet. Yeah, you can do it all by yourself. It's yeah. not big right. enough. Right, right, right. Um, and so what mm -hmm. I what I say is that relationships are the breadcrumbs to your destiny. Mm -hmm. Every single person that you are destined to meet brings you one degree closer to being on the perfect trajectory for accomplishing your destiny. I love it. Like, we got to talk about wellness. Yeah, man. let's talk about it. So historically. Wellness for African Americans wasn't a conversation. Yeah. We were kind of in survival mode. You're yeah. not going to talk about wellness and eating healthy yeah. foods if you're in survival mode. Yeah. You are creating something Let right now that's changing the game. In this. Talk to us about it. Yeah, so I think that wellness is, you know, wellness is so important. And particularly in the African American community, you know, when you know, us having control over our bodies is something that is like mm. very fresh and new. Mm. You know, the African-American community is uh, is a baby. Mm. You know, we've had independence for like 60 years. Mm -hmm. you know, like 60 years ago, we got the right to vote. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Yeah. So in terms of being, you know, a free people, um, being able to, uh, you know, strive for our community has been something that's been incredibly limited. I am the first person first generation in my family that was not under some form of legal discrimination, mm. right? Where the police would show up and enforce discrimination. My dad used the black only bathroom, mm. right? Not my granddad, my dad, Yeah, yeah. right? So, you know, um, you know, this whole concept of wellness is something that is something that we have to develop mm. from the ground up for our community. Mm -hmm. You know, now that we can read, mm -hmm. that we're mm -hmm. allowed to read, mm -hmm. you know, now that we're allowed to have, you know, like health insurance, now that we're allowed to like, you know, own homes, mm -hmm. all that stuff was strategically and diabolically, right. you know, kept mm -hmm. from us as a people. Mm -hmm. So mental health is something that it's like, a blue ocean, mm. you know, African-American mental health is an untapped industry in the sense that we have millions of miles, mm -hmm. you know, millions of acres for us to ex to explore in that space yeah. here in, in here in America. I look forward to, uh, especially as black males, making that more realistic, making that more consistent, making that normal, if you may. So I appreciate you sharing that expression. Yeah. Now, I know Jay's dying over here, man. Let me go on past the mic, bro. Let's what you got, it. man? Oh, so here in Raleigh, uh, I knew you from Oak City Fish and Chips. Uh, I've got a few questions on that. One, what's your favorite thing off the menu <laughs> on Oak City Fish and Chips? The favorite thing off the menu, I'd say, is my fried salmon pop. Mm. Mm. It's not on the menu. I saw oh, that. That's a limited edition. Say, I see, I, it was a limited edition. You did a reel on that. The regular menu would be my lobster pop. Okay. Mm. The, the, but, you know, the my, the favorite thing I ever served was the salmon pop. Uh, and that mm. was this past year at the, at the North Carolina State Fair. Mm. Mm. Can yeah. we get the recipe for that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, 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 you started very modest of uh, Oak City Fish and Chips. Excuse me. Oak City Fish and Chips with the trucks to the brick and mortar. You were telling me between the break that um, you're doing some big things in terms of allowing it to be franchised. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Absolutely. So I believe as an entrepreneur, to get to the next level, the next apex in your career, always stems from empowering other people to, to stand beside mm -hmm. you on that level. Mm -hmm. 
when that level becomes full, it indirectly pushes you up to the next level. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Oak City Fish and Chips has been making, you know, over a million dollars a year now, mm -hmm. consistently. Um, and I want to empower other people mm -hmm. to take the same path that I took, right. you know, to a certain extent, skipping the earlier <laughs> years of me starting off with the one food truck, yeah. going from fish to adding shrimp to, but to yeah. start off where I am now right. and allowing them to not stumble in the dark, but empower them with a proven system and model. Mm. Um, and so that's what franchising, that's the epitome of franchising. So Oak City Fish and Chips will be the first black owned national seafood franchise mm -hmm. in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, we are planning to award 100 franchises mm -hmm. over the next 36 to 48 months. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna start off uh, on the East Coast mm -hmm. and then we will extend out to the Midwest um, and to the West Coast but I'm excited about empowering other people. My goal is to create 50 black millionaires. Yeah. Oak City Fish and Chips. Well, sign us up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> sign us up, baby. You heard it right here on the Broke Code Show. Yeah. Now, taking that to the springboard to what we've been teasing all day, yeah. the hydroponics. Tell, tell us more about that world, the business that your father and yourself are, are, are creating, and what is that going to do to the landscape of food in general? Yeah, so right out of undergraduate school, I went on a missions trip to Nicaragua, and uh, it was there while feeding thousands of starving children that God put in my heart that that was what my destiny was. Mm -hmm. As a little kid, I always knew that I wanted to do something great. I want to have a world impact. Mm -hmm. um, being sovereign uh, to a certain extent within my own earth experience mm -hmm. uh, was something that I knew I'd have, to, I'd have to accomplish in order to affect and help other people. You have to be in control of your own life. Mm -hmm. So you have to be independent yeah. mm -hmm. uh, to, in order to get into a stage of interdependency where you can partner with others to be able to you know, create great change. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, while I was there, I saw the first person in my life who had starved to death and it was jarring. It shook me up and I actually had scaled um, a volcano. When I was looking over the edge, that's when God spoke to me and said that that's what he was gonna be doing with me, mm -hmm. was helping with, with, with world hunger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I feel personally responsible for feeding one billion people. Mm -hmm. One seventh of the earth. Mm -hmm. That's my plan. That's my goal. Mm -hmm. That's it. And, and, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> and, 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 and so Oak, Oak City Fish and Chips uh, was a precursor. Um, while I came in as a 26 year old uh, with a desire to be a food producer, I didn't have $3 million when I was 26. Mm -hmm. um, and so I came in humbly through the back door food service yeah. with the ultimate plan to transition into food production, mm -hmm. you know, when I cross certain financial finish lines. Yeah. So uh, this past uh, year, 2022, on my birthday, January 8th, 2022, uh, we formed the Green Blue Marketplace. Mm. The Green Blue Marketplace is a health and longevity marketplace mm. with super organic produce as its centerpiece. Mm. Um, it is so much more complex and so much bigger than just food. For example, 25% of our business is mindset, mm -hmm. uh, it's coaching. Mm -hmm. um, because what we are trying to teach people to do is to live to be 100 years of age mm -hmm. um, or older, mm -hmm. healthy. Mm -hmm. And we do that by introducing people to the principles of what are called longevity hotspots or blue zones. These are naturally occurring areas in the world where the average person lives to be 100 years of age. Mm. The average person, mm. not one in 10 or you know, wow. one in four, but 60% mm. of the people are living to be 100 years of age. Mm. So we take these principles right. out of the blue zones mm -hmm. and we put these principles into your neighborhoods inside of this model yeah. that we've created called the Green Blue Marketplace. Mm. Green. Uh, stands for sustainability uh, and blue stands for longevity. Mm. You can have longevity or you can practice good habits, but if you can't sustain it, mm. you can't hold it. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm. So a marketplace in the sense that we will have different products and services made available to the members of the Green Blue Marketplace, which is a private club. Mm -hmm. uh, and we will be providing them with products and services direct, cutting out the middleman. Our model is uh, no middleman. Hmm. Uh, we go direct. Yeah. We're the farmer, mm -hmm. we're the retailer, mm -hmm. and we're the distributor. Mm -hmm. um, we provide you with 
coaching services because if you're going to live to be 100 years of age, you have to manage your money differently. Yeah. So we oh, call yeah. these people longevity coaches because the average person in America only plans their retirement, you know, to a certain yes, a certain sure. age. That's right. 75 or 80 years of, years old. Mm -hmm. The average black man dies at 68. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we look at and you know, looked at when my father and I began this work seven years ago, behind the scenes of Oak City Fish and Chips, I've secretly had two jobs. Mm. I've been running Oak City Fish and Chips while pouring a good amount of my resources and my time into the development of the Green Blue Marketplace. We had a 4,000 square foot facility off Capitol Boulevard in 2017 for three years where we secretly grew over 66 different species of fresh fruits and vegetables hydroponically. Wow. And we did research on these things. My father is the third African-American in North Carolina to get a PhD in chemistry and has a PhD in synthetic organic chemistry of natural products. My dad was one of the first 12 drug designers in the world yeah. with no other drugs that had ever been designed before. My father's the first African-American drug designer in the world. Mm. Um, and so he worked for a, coupon, a, a company called DuPont. We got a pa I pause. <laughs> Dr. Horton, what? we need you on the bro <laughs> Show. I, I just, got, I just had to pause yeah. there real quick. Yeah. Uh, my grandmother worked at DuPont in New Jersey. Go ahead. No. Yeah, that's what my dad worked at, 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 at DuPont Pharmaceuticals. DuPont, as, uh, the DuPont family is one of the richest families in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, the DuPont uh, Pharmaceutical Company uh, had a Vax computer. Mm -hmm. We're talking about 30 years ago. Um, the only organization outside the CIA and NSA that had a VATS computer where you could dance around the molecules. And my dad and 11 of his other colleagues designed the first drugs on a VATS computer. And what they say was that they were arrogant to think that you could take one molecule out of a plant, mm. synthesize it, put it in a pill and give it to you and you would be healed. Now, when we first began this work in 2016, the food scientists had discovered 200 phytonutrients. Phytonutrients is the medicine that's in the plants. Mm -hmm. These are smaller molecules, not big molecules like vitamin C, mm -hmm. but this is something that's measured in nanograms like liposine, mm -hmm. for example. Um, and these phytonutrients uh, operate in concert like a symphony of molecules in the body. Now, the analytical science in the past four years has grown so much that they discovered over 50,000 phytonutrients. Hmm. And so in terms of human intelligence, we're just now starting to get a little bit of smart. You know, 70 yeah. years ago, the average person on earth couldn't even read, right? Right. Now we understand from a food science standpoint that the reason why everybody is sick, while one in two people now hmm. in America are said to have cancer, hmm. while 80% of people over the age of 80, 50% uh, of them, rather not 80%, but 50% of the people over the age of 80 are suffering from dementia. Uh, six in 10 American, uh, 10 Americans have at least one chronic illness. And if you're over 65, it's 80% of people have a chronic illness is because the phytonutrients dissipate from the fruits mm. and vegetable within three to five days after they're picked. Mm. Uh, so, um, but it takes two to three weeks for, for the food to get on the shelves at the grocery <laughs> shelves. It was old, old. 50% of the food <laughs> oh. that we eat in the United States of America come from overseas. 80% mm -hmm. of the fruits and vegetables are irrigated. Mm. The water in the aquifer that you irrigate from is not regulated by the EPA. That water is polluted. Mm. Uh, in Eastern North Carolina, that water is polluted with hog waste, chicken waste, turkey waste, steroids, antibiotics. In Central North Carolina, uh, the aquifer is polluted with Duke Powers coal ash. Mm. Over 200 different contaminants found in the water. Well, the average fruit and vegetable is 65 to 95% water. A cucumber is 95% water. Um, so while what we say the Green Blue Marketplace is, while you may not be going in your backyard and drinking from the river or stream, mm -hmm. you are every time you eat a fruit or vegetable fruit because or vegetable. the fruit or vegetable absorbs the Man, toxic I water from the aquifer. And while it may not have, while it may be organic, mm -hmm. it doesn't have fungicides, pesticides, or herbicides sprayed on it, it still has non-toxic H2O. I, 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 thought, I thought I was doing something in my particular way. We've got about three minutes left on the show, probably about 90 seconds. I want you to take 60 of those seconds to answer this. Someone's asked, we answered this question on another show, but why is ownership important for our community, especially as a culture in 60 seconds or less? It is impossible to have generational wealth without ownership. The African-American community needs to start creating a platform of empowerment 
for generational wealth. Mm. We are way behind. Yeah. Not to our own fault, but because of our circumstance. Yeah. Being, you know, freed refugees mm -hmm. here. Lack of access. Right. Yeah. Generational wealth mm -hmm. is what we must focus on. We have to lay the foundation for generational wealth by creating a circular economy mm -hmm. that has businesses, resources that we could pass on to the next generation. Uh, and so ownership is the first step in creating generational wealth. A network of ownership is the second step. Mm. Um, and then a highly efficient network that uses its resources to create the pillars of society for our community, transportation, education, um, you know, business and finance, creating the security, uh, uh, communication, all these different mm -hmm. pillars of society is something that every single other group in America has established for themselves right. because they were allowed to choose to come here. When mm -hmm. you don't, when that, that, that choice in coming to America allows plan and preparation and allows people to bring their resources from their homeland here, tying them back into health and wellness, for example, the mm. reason why African-Americans are the most unhealthy uh, group in the United States is because through the voluntary entrance into the country, allowed other ethnicities to bring their seeds right. from their own homeland. I love it. As we wrap this Ooh, conversation up, Isaac, I, we could go on for days. <laughs> we, we really could, man. Like, we're going to have to do a part two. But one, we want to say thank you. Yes, sir. We want to thank well, you for taking the opportunity. Yeah. We're going to do another segment in another scene okay. uh, really quickly because we got some questions from the crowd after this great information. Okay. But we want to say thank you for coming on. We look forward to continuing right. to connecting. Uh, we look forward to sharing the ideas and continuing to push our community forward. Absolutely. All right. So it's your boy, Bro Troy. Bro Smith. The Kirk. And we are. Bro Smith. Groove Nation. Turn it up. 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 It's your boy, Bro Troy. You're right here with the Juggernauts, media juggernauts called The Bro Code Show. We just finished up another show. We got my man, Isaac Brennan Horton IV. He's got like 80,000 names, but I actually got it right this time, man. So I'm going to pat myself on the back. Nonetheless, man, we have a segment on the show where we believe in giving people their flowers while they're still here. So here on our show, The Bro Code Show, we different. We use a two dollar bill in the two dollar bill segment. What you got, bro? Absolutely. So, I, first of all, thank you for being on the show. Absolutely. Uh, we give this out every time. Our whole team has signed it. Yeah. You gave us your word. Visionary. Ooh. Very. Ooh. We understand. Yes. You it understand. says you matter <laughs> on the front, man. We really appreciate what you're doing in the community, bro. Keep doing what you're doing. It's inspiring. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me, guys. This is dope. You gotta show the camera, man. You gotta show. You gotta show the camera. Put it up to the camera. Let them know. This we give it out money code, baby. on the Bro Code Show, baby. Probably North Carolina. I already know. I yeah. already know. So, man, we're excited for everything that you've done and everything that you're going to do. I'm just blessed to be in the presence, man. Thank you for the time. Absolutely. We'll check you on the next one. All right. Another one. We out, baby. In my wallet, yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> With the smoothest DJ, DJ D Dub, Groove Nation. Turn it up, turn it up, turn it up, turn it up. Boy, I told you I'm a beast. Feel like David and the lion in the streets, though. Stay humble as I can be. But devil, you don't want no problems. I go get smart. In the cage, but homie, I got the keys to the gate, so I'm about to break free. Break, break. Got a lot of dreams on my plate, like Jordan, man, I was built for the game. You ain't gonna break me. Break, break. I keep on giving till you had enough. Had enough.